It's Battle of the Bands week here at the Flaming Heart. The meanest, loudest, rowdiest bar this side of the Mississippi. And nothing gets the crowd going quite like a little inflammation, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, literal inflammation. You see, last time we were here, we sat at the bar, chewed the fat for a while, and discussed the various etiologies of myocarditis. You know, usual bar talk. This time, however, we're going to focus on the fibroelastic tissue layers surrounding the heart. Yep, it's time we talked about that pericardium. At Sketchy, the myocardium is often represented by a heart-shaped guitar. A guitar case, then, represents the pericardium that encases the heart. Also, you see how red and inflamed the lining looks? That's pericarditis. Pericarditis is a relatively common disorder, and it can be an isolated syndrome or part of a greater systemic disease. First thing I just want to get out of the way. Many of the causes of myocarditis that we covered in the last sketch are the same as those for pericarditis. So take a look in the back there, and you should recognize all of the usual flaming heart patrons that we met in the myocarditis sketch. Just like before, most cases of acute pericarditis are due to viral infection or are considered idiopathic. Other causes include bacterial infection, drug reactions, and autoimmune disorders. In this sketch, we're going to focus on a few of the more common etiologies, as well as a few causes that are particularly associated with pericarditis rather than myocarditis itself. A big one is lupus, and you know there's no finer backup singer than our recurring lupus wolf, bang at the moon. A majority of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus will have some kind of pericardial involvement, usually manifesting as an asymptomatic pericardial effusion. Keep an open mind though, because a vast number of other rheumatic diseases can also involve the pericardium, including rheumatoid arthritis. Think back to our myocardial infarction video as well. At Sketchy, whenever we mention MI, we'll always include a broken heart string. Myocardial infarction is associated with two types of pericarditis. A fibrinous pericarditis two to four days after the MI, localized to the area of necrosis. And then there's Dresler's syndrome, a more diffuse autoimmune pericarditis that occurs months after the initial event. An important cause of metabolic pericardial disease is uremia, as we'll illustrate in our renal unit, in the setting of acute renal insufficiency or an exacerbation of chronic renal insufficiency, the filtration of urea is inhibited. So it builds up in the serum and is measured as blood urea nitrogen, or BUN. See all that BUN bun grease kind of sopping onto her shirt there? All that urea retention can lead to some major systemic symptoms, including uremic pericarditis. And lastly, we gotta mention malignant pericarditis. Pretty much any kind of malignancy can metastasize to the pericardium, including lung, breast, and Hodgkin lymphoma. See the little crab symbols on those guitar picks he's throwing into the crowd? Think of them as little metastases, floating around in the serum and finding their way to the pericardium. Malignant pericarditis can manifest in all kinds of ways, including pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, or even constrictive pericarditis. We're going to illustrate all of these effects in the remainder of our sketch. That means it's time to get clinical. Acute pericarditis can present in a variety of ways, depending on the underlying disorder. However, remember that, just like in myocarditis, pericarditis is usually idiopathic, or if the cause is identified, it's usually some kind of viral infection. So in the clinic or on test day, Pay attention to that patient who experienced flu-like respiratory or GI symptoms last week, and now, all of a sudden, is presenting to your office with chest pain. Hmm, viral pericarditis much? Patients with an infectious cause of pericarditis may show signs of systemic infection such as leukocytosis and fever, embodied, as always, by a recurring flame bandana. Expect some tachycardia as well, hence that elevated heart watch being held by the manager. Okay, time to get off the stage, buddy. The next band is up. Yeah, I get it. You learned Stairway to Heaven when you were 15, just like every other high schooler with a guitar. And now you think you're Ingve Malmsteen. Come back when you learn a little thing I call music theory. The vast majority of patients with acute pericarditis will also present with chest pain. They'll usually describe a sharp pain in the anterior chest that's provoked by things like swallowing, or deep breaths, 
And funny enough, it's better when leaning forward. Your patient is describing what's called pleuritic chest pain. At Sketchy, that characteristic sharp pain that's worse on inspiration and better when leaning forward is symbolized by a razor-sharp shark tooth necklace sitting against the chest. See how far forward he leans as he does a complete disservice to Van Halen, the patron saint of all that is rad and pure and awesome? The pericardium is composed of a visceral and parietal layer separated by a potential space. In normal individuals, this pericardial space contains 15 to 50 milliliters of plasma. Not much. So when the two layers of the pericardium get inflamed, they tend to rub against each other. And on cardiac exam, you might hear a pericardial friction rub. Hear that? It's a kind of squeaky grating sound that occurs with each beat. Just imagine the friction that's caused by this crazed fan here, as she's dragged off the stage by security. One special feature of a pericardial friction rub is that it does not disappear when you hold your breath. As long as your heart is beating, the friction continues. A pleural friction rub, on the other hand, which is heard in the setting of pleuritis, will disappear when the lungs aren't moving. Now, as inflammation takes over the pericardium, it's probably not hard to imagine that the heart itself, which is sitting right underneath, also feels some of the heat. Well, in more than 50% of patients, the epicardium will get involved as well. That's the outermost layer of the heart, overlying the myocardium. Once this occurs, expect to see a few changes on ECG, usually in the first few hours to days of the acute pericarditis episode. See that diffuse array of ST street signs decorating the wall behind the stage? I don't know, just really ties the whole place together. Gives it a kind of Patrick Swayze roadhouse vibe, don't you think? This represents the diffuse ST segment elevations you can see on ECG, indicating that inflammation has extended into the epicardium. That's right, I said ST elevations, just like the ones we saw during a myocardial infarction. Well, almost. There are actually a few key differences to keep in mind, especially on a test question, when you need to quickly decipher that ECG. First of all, the ST elevations seen in pericarditis have a more sloping, concave up shape, instead of that classic MI tombstone shape. And secondly, Take a look around the whole tracing. You should see those ST elevations pretty much everywhere, not just in a few leads. A patient presenting with acute chest pain will likely get a cardiac echo as well. And in acute pericarditis, the echo will often look completely normal. About half the time, however, you'll be able to spot a pericardial effusion. See that water bottle there, knocked over in the scuffle? As the pericardial guitar case fills with fluid, Imagine that potential space between the visceral and parietal pericardium filling with serous inflammatory exudate. Most of the time, this effusion is small, but it definitely supports the diagnosis of pericarditis. Now, pericardial effusion comes in two delicious flavors. There's serous, and then there's hemorrhagic. In the setting of pericarditis, you'll most likely find a serous one. It's similar to the one you might see in congestive heart failure. Remember the Little Mermaid soaked briefcase? The pericardium is fed by its own set of vessels, and heart failure causes these vessels to back up and leak fluid into the space. It's the same process that causes peripheral edema. That's a transudate, however, just serum leaking through. The effusions caused by pericarditis, on the other hand, contain exudative inflammatory fluid, and sometimes it can even be hemorrhagic. This is often the case in uremic pericarditis. That's why underneath our uremic BUN bun lady, we've drawn in some ketchup. Kinda sero-sanguinous looking on the floor there. As we'll show you later at the Chronic Kidney Dino Museum, uremia causes platelet dysfunction, as evidenced by those shabby looking stegosaurus plates. So expect some bleeding with that effusion. Malignant pericarditis is also associated with the hemorrhagic effusion. Remember, this lady dropping the ketchup is also reaching out for those metastatic guitar picks. All right, remember that the pericardial space normally contains about 15 to 50 milliliters of serous fluid. It's more of a potential space, really. And the parietal pericardium, that outermost layer, is actually quite rigid. It doesn't really want to take on much more volume than that. So a stiff guitar case, like this one, 
is a pretty fitting symbol when you think about it. Even small pericardial effusions can fill that space to capacity and put some major pressure on the heart underneath. See that sticker on the side of the case? Speed kills. So metal. It emphasizes the fact that the rate, not the volume, of fluid entry determines how severe the effusion is. Slowly collecting effusions can expand to as much as 1,000 milliliters. Rapidly developing collections of as little as 250 milliliters, however, can cause a condition called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is like a fist squeezing the heart. It puts external pressure on every chamber and limits the heart's ability to expand and fill during diastole. And when your heart can't fill, say goodbye to cardiac output. The classic presentation of cardiac tamponade includes JVD, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. This is known as Beck's Triad, which also happens to be the name of the heavy metal trio about to take the stage. Again, just imagine the heart not being able to expand, and the symptoms become pretty self-explanatory. Jugular venous distension, or JVD, is depicted, as always, by the big distended blue jug. The jugular veins distend because a heart that can't fill will send pressure right back up into that venous system. Also, if a heart can't fill, it has nothing to pump. So watch out for severely reduced cardiac output leading to hypotension and eventually cardiogenic shock. Yeah, that guy is out. Which is so metal. And thirdly, on cardiac exam, the heart sounds will be muffled as you try to listen through that fluid-filled pericardial sac. Just think of the earmuffs worn by the drummer here. Ugh, man, I just... I can't take it. Because hearing protection is so heavy metal! Alright, because there's extrinsic pressure on the entire heart from the fluid in the effusion, there can be near-equal pressures in the cardiac chambers. This leads to an interesting phenomenon called pulsus paradoxus. We'll illustrate it underneath our stage diver here, wearing the Pulsus Paradoxus t-shirt. It's the newest album from Beck's triad. Anyways, imagine him putting equal pressure on all the audience members beneath him. They're going to represent the left and the right chambers, with a septum in between. As the security guy struggles under the weight, we tried to make him depict someone taking a big, deep breath in. The increase in venous return during inspiration causes the right ventricle to fill. In the setting of cardiac tamponade, however, the right ventricle can't expand outward due to the effusion. So instead, the interventricular septum bows out to the left. The left ventricle chamber size is now decreased, which leads to decreased left ventricular end diastolic volume and decreased stroke volume. This causes a drop in systolic blood pressure greater than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration. That's pulsus paradoxus, my friends. If you're not carrying a sphygmomanometer like this guy, try feeling for the radial pulse instead. During inspiration, the pulse will be undetectable as stroke volume drops. This, combined with JVD, muffled heart sounds, and hypotension, just screams cardiac tamponade. It needs to be treated quickly, by the way, because tamponade can rapidly progress to cardiogenic shock. The only treatment is emergent pericardiosynthesis to remove the fluid. That means sticking a big needle into the pericardial space and just... Is he really? Yep. Okay, now that is frickin' heavy metal. You win, dude. Alright, we're going to finish off this sketch with yet another debilitating consequence of pericarditis called constrictive pericarditis. You see, when the inflammation is severe, sometimes it never quite heals correctly leading to extensive fibrosis of the pericardium. There can even be adhesions and dense fibrotic scars that obliterate the pericardial space. If calcification and fibrosis are severe enough, it can prevent the heart from expanding normally during diastole, hence the constrictive aspect of constrictive pericarditis. It's depicted by the cowgirl here, as she wrangles the waiter over to take her order. Notice that her lasso is really constricting that heart. A constrictive pericardium actually presents in much the same way as restrictive cardiomyopathy. Remember that restrictive net holding back the heart at the Highland Games? In both cases, the heart can't fill during diastole, either from a bulky ventricular wall or, as illustrated on the right, a scarred constricting pericardium. 
patients with either constrictive pericarditis or restrictive cardiomyopathy display jugular venous distension, or JVD, on physical exam. Let that big blue distended jug remind you of distended jugular veins caused by impeded venous return. Remember, the heart just doesn't want to fill. In both disorders, the pulsations in that distended jugular vein show what's called a prominent Y descent, represented by this Y-shaped glass descending to the ground next to our dilated jug. Remember, in the jugular venous pressure waveform, the pressure dips down twice. The first X descent corresponds with the atrium relaxing. The second Y descent corresponds with the atrium emptying when the tricuspid valve opens. Well, you can imagine if the wall of the heart is really stiff, it springs back quickly to fill with blood. It kind of sucks that jugular blood down with it. This causes a big dip, or prominent Y descent, in that jugular pressure. Taking a deep breath usually increases venous return and pulls more blood into the pulmonary circuit. But in restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis, your heart is restricted and can't fill. So a deep breath will actually cause more blood to back up in the venous system, increasing JVD. That's called Kussmaul sign, and it's represented by the next cowgirl, as she elevates that distended jugular jug while taking a big whiff of those Kussmaul cookies. In the end, it can progress to a diastolic heart failure. Remember, that means filling problems. So we've made sure to include a recurring floppy failing heart balloon. Expect the usual symptoms of systemic congestion. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, you're going to listen for S3 and S4 gallops on cardiac exam. In constrictive pericarditis, listen for that classic pericardial knock. It's caused by the ventricles hitting that thickened parietal pericardium as they try to expand. It occurs around the same time as an S3 heart sound, however, so it can be difficult to distinguish. Pericardial calcification may also be present on chest radiograph or CT. It kind of looks like a white rim of calcium surrounding the heart, kind of like the white brim that outlines the cowboy hats. This is highly suggestive of constrictive pericarditis, though you won't be able to see it in most patients. Constrictive pericarditis can occur after pretty much any kind of acute pericarditis. So remember all of the etiologies we've illustrated at the flaming heart. When the pericardium doesn't heal correctly and fibrosis sets in, the disease can progress over months, sometimes culminating in constrictive disease. One classic example of this is in tuberculous pericarditis, which occurs when a pulmonary TB infection spreads to the pericardium. At Sketchy, pulmonary TB is represented by cavitary lesions affecting a pulmonary cactus. And, as you know, mycobacteria are always Wild West-themed. Perfect, right? Watch out for the typical clinical manifestations of constrictive pericarditis developing in patients who may be harboring an active tuberculosis infection. This includes immigrants or travelers from TB endemic regions, as well as patients with HIV. Other common causes of constrictive pericarditis include open heart surgery, when slicing right through that pericardium can lead to scarring. And lastly, keep mediastinal radiation in mind. Constrictive pericarditis can occur after radiation therapy to the chest in patients being treated for Hodgkin lymphoma, breast cancer, or lung cancer. And it may be years before they show any symptoms. Luckily, improved shielding and dose calculation have reduced the incidence of this complication. All right, that about wraps it up. As the late, great Patrick Swayze used to say, at the Flaming Heart, all you have to do is follow three simple rules. One, Never underestimate your opponent. Expect the unexpected. In other words, watch out for pericarditis, turning to effusion, turning to tamponade. It's a cardiac emergency that presents with JVD, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. Chronic pericarditis may even lead to constrictive disease manifesting as diastolic heart failure. Two, take it outside. I'm pretty sure by that he meant all those causes of myocarditis well, they can cause pericarditis as well. It's usually idiopathic or viral in nature. And three, be nice. Pretty sure he was emphasizing the diffuse, concave up, smiley face looking ST segment elevation seen in pericarditis. Turn that frowny ST elevation upside down.